I'm Nikki Strong, and this is VOA One The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Jill Robbins reports on a female presidential candidate in Senegal. Dan Friedel has a story on an AI robot that helps find sick tulips in the Netherlands. Gina Bennett has this week's Ask a Teacher lesson, and we listen to a story by Mark Twain called The Californian's Tale. But first... Senegal's only female presidential candidate may have little chance of winning Sunday's election, but activists say her presence alone is important. They argue that the candidacy of Anta Babakar Gam is helping create gender equality in the West African nation. Gam is a 40-year-old business executive who runs her family's food company. She has made the economy a center of her campaign. Economic difficulty has driven thousands of Senegalese on sometimes dangerous travel in search of a better life outside Africa. Gom appears to be a voice for both women and young people, groups hard hit by unemployment and rising prices. She has promised to create millions of jobs and a bank for women. She says such actions will help women gain economic independence. She told the Associated Press, The young girls I meet ask for my support. They do so because they know that when a woman comes to power, she will put an end to their suffering. I'm not going to forget them. Gam is the first female candidate to run for president in over 10 years. Few expect her to win, but activists say her candidacy demonstrates how women are moving ahead in the struggle for equality. We have to be there, even if we don't stand a chance, said Selly Ba, an activist and sociologist. We don't stand a chance in these elections. But it's important that we have women candidates, women who are in the race, Senegal had its first female prime minister in 2001, and in 2010, a law that required all political parties to introduce gender parity in elections helped increase female involvement in politics. Women's rights have evolved at the political level over the last 10 years, and particularly since the gender parity law came into force said Boso Sambe, a former parliamentarian. In 2012, two women ran for president, and while they earned less than 1% of the vote each, experts say their participation was important. Women in Senegal now make up more than 40% of parliament, one of the highest levels of representation in Africa. Gam told the AP, women must be able to express themselves without hindrance while preserving our cultural identity and valuing the traditional values that have shaped our society. Gom's supporters say they are proud to back a female candidate and hopeful for a change in the next government. Our children are dying at sea because of unemployment and job insecurity. Activist Aisha Ba said at a recent demonstration. She added, women are tired. I'm Jill Robbins.
Theo works days, nights, and weekends in the tulip fields in the Netherlands and never complains of sore muscles. How is this possible? Theo is an artificial intelligence, or AI, robot, that looks for diseased flowers each spring. The work prevents viruses from spreading among the valuable plants. The robot looks for troubled tulip bulbs and destroys them if necessary. They are removed from the healthy ones in a processing center after the harvest. There are 45 robots like Theo working in the tulip fields of the Netherlands. Their job becomes important as the winter turns to spring and peak season nears. People come from around the world to see the colorful flowers. Alain Visser's family has been growing tulips for three generations. This is the second season that he has used a robot. He said, It is very costly. The same as a sports car. About $200,000. In the past, knowledgeable farmers would walk the fields looking for tulips that showed signs of sickness. I prefer to have the robot because a sports car doesn't take out the sick tulips from our field, he said. Yeah, it is expensive, but there are less and less people who can really see the sick tulips. The robot has been trained to see the sick plants. Red stripes show up on the leaves of infected plants. The robots roll through the fields very slowly, about one kilometer per hour, looking for sick tulips. Visser called the work precision agriculture, as he explained how the robots work. He said the robots have cameras and take thousands of photos of the tulips. The AI software considers the photos and decides which tulips need to be killed. The robot has learned to recognize this and treat it, Visser said. H2L Robotics is the company that makes the robots. Eric de Jong is the managing director. He said the robots use GPS coordinates to be sure they are killing the correct tulip among many tulips in the field. He said all of the knowledge they use in the computer program that informs the robot comes from tulip farmers, farmers like Theo Vandervoort. He is the farmer that the robot is named after. Vandervoort retired after 52 years of looking for sick flowers in his fields. It's fantastic, he said. It sees just as much as I see. I'm Dan Friedel. Teacher, we answer a question from Lola. Hello, I'm Lola from Madrid. My question is about the pronunciation of the word L I V E. Sometimes the pronunciation is live and others live. The same with the word. L I V E S. Why? Thank you very much. Thank you for writing, Lola. This is such a good question. L I V E is an example 
of a heteronym or words that have the same spelling but different pronunciations and meanings. There are nearly 100 heteronyms in English. But let's get to your question about the word spelled L-I-V-E today. It can be either an adjective, an adverb, or a verb. When it is used as an adjective or adverb, we use the I sound, like live. I love live music. Are you watching the game live? When it is used as a verb, we use the I sound, like live. Where do you live? We live just outside the city. As for the word spelled L-I-V-E-S, it can be either a plural noun from the singular life or third person singular verb. When it is a plural noun, we use the I sound. Cats have nine lives. When it is used as third person singular, we use the I sound. She lives with her mother. So, in order to know which pronunciation to use for L-I-V-E and S, you want to look carefully at how it is used in a sentence. Please let us know if this explanation has helped you, Lola. Do you have a question about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Gina Bennett. Gina Bennett is here now to talk with us about this week's Ask a Teacher. Hi, Dr. Gina. Hi, Dan. This week's program talked about why the word L-I-V-E can be said two ways, live and live. You mentioned that it's an example of a heteronym. I've never heard that word before. That's right. Heteronyms are words that have the same spelling, but different pronunciations and meanings. L-I-V-E is pronounced live when the word is used as a verb, and live when it is used as an adjective or adverb. The program said there are nearly 100 heteronyms in English. This could be one reason pronunciation and spelling in English can be so difficult. You're exactly right, Dan. Some languages are phonetic, or pronounced the way they are spelled. This means that each letter of the alphabet represents only one sound. That's definitely not the case for English. It is not, no. English has 44 sounds, but only 26 letters. So one letter represents more than one sound. There are even different letters that represent the same sound. In fact, there is only one letter that only makes one sound in English. Can you guess what it is? Hmm. Is it the letter V? Yes. Nicely done. V is also the only letter that is never silent in English. Interesting. Thanks for coming on the show, Gina. And thanks for talking with me today, Dan. Our story today is called... The Californian's Tale. 
It was written by Mark Twain. Here is Shep O'Neill with the story. When I was young, I went looking for gold in California. I never found enough to make me rich, but I did discover a beautiful part of the country. It was called the Stanislaw. The Stanislaw was like heaven on earth. It had bright green hills and deep forests where soft winds touched the trees. Other men, also looking for gold, had reached the Stanislaw Hills of California many years before I did. They had built a town in the valley with sidewalks and stores, banks and schools. They had also built pretty little houses for their families. At first, they found a lot of gold in the Stanislaw Hills, but their good luck did not last. After a few years, the gold disappeared. By the time I reached the Stanislaw, all the people were gone too. Grass now grew in the streets, and the little houses were covered by wild rose bushes. Only the sound of insects filled the air as I walked through the empty town that summer day so long ago. Then I realized I was not alone after all. A man was smiling at me as he stood in front of one of the little houses. This house was not covered by wild rose bushes. A nice little garden in front of the house was full of blue and yellow flowers. White curtains hung from the windows and floated in the soft summer wind. Still smiling, the man opened the door of his house and motioned to me. I went inside and could not believe my eyes. I had been living for weeks in rough mining camps with other gold miners. We slept on the hard ground, ate canned beans from cold metal plates, and spent our days in the difficult search for gold. Here in this little house, my spirit seemed to come to life again. I saw a bright rug on the shining wooden floor. Pictures hung all around the room, and on little tables there were seashells, books, and china vases full of flowers. A woman had made this house into a home. The pleasure I felt in my heart must have shown on my face. The man read my thoughts. Yes, he smiled, it is all her work. Everything in this room has felt the touch of her hand. One of the pictures on the wall was not hanging straight. He noticed it and went to fix it. He stepped back several times to make sure the picture was really straight. Then he gave it a gentle touch with his hand. She always does that, he explained to me. It is like the finishing pat a mother gives her child's hair after she has brushed it. I have seen her fix all these things so often that I can do it just the way she does. I don't know why I do it. I just do it. As he talked, I realized there was something in this room that he wanted me to discover. I looked around. When my eyes reached a corner of the room near the fireplace, he broke into a happy laugh and rubbed his hands together. That's it, he cried out. You have found it. I knew you would. It is her picture. I went to a little black shelf 
that held a small picture of the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. There was a sweetness and softness in the woman's expression that I had never seen before. The man took the picture from my hands and stared at it. She was nineteen on her last birthday. That was the day we were married. When you see her, oh, just wait until you meet her. Where is she now? I asked. Oh, she is away, the man sighed, putting the picture back on the little black shelf. She went to visit her parents. They live forty or fifty miles from here. She has been gone two weeks today. When will she be back? I asked. Well, this is Wednesday, he said slowly. She will be back on Saturday, in the evening. I felt a sharp sense of regret. I am sorry, because I will be gone by then, I said. Gone? No, why should you go? Don't go. She will be so sorry. You see, she likes to have people come and stay with us. No, I really must leave, I said firmly. He picked up her picture and held it before my eyes. Here, he said. Now you tell her to her face that you could have stayed to meet her and you would not. Something made me change my mind as I looked at the picture for a second time. I decided to stay. The man told me his name was Henry. That night, Henry and I talked about many different things, but mainly about her. The next day passed quietly. Thursday evening, we had a visitor. He was a big, gray-haired miner named Tom. I just came for a few minutes to ask when she's coming home, he explained. Is there any news? Oh, yes, the man replied. I got a letter. Would you like to hear it? He took a yellowed letter out of his shirt pocket and read it to us. It was full of loving messages to him and to other people, their close friends and neighbors. When the man finished reading it, he looked at his friend. Oh, no, you are doing it again, Tom. You always cry when I read a letter from her. I'm going to tell her this time. No, you must not do that, Henry, the gray-haired miner said. I am getting old, and any little sorrow makes me cry. I really was hoping she would be here tonight. The next day, Friday, another old miner came to visit. He asked to hear the letter. The message in it made him cry, too. We all miss her so much, he said. Saturday finally came. I found I was looking at my watch very often. Henry noticed this. You don't think something has happened to her, do you? he asked me. I smiled and said that I was sure she was just fine but he did not seem satisfied. I was glad to see his two friends, Tom and Joe, coming down the road as the sun began to set. The old miners were carrying guitars. They also brought flowers and a bottle of whiskey. They put the flowers in vases and began to play some fast and lively songs on their guitars. Henry's friends kept 
giving him glasses of whiskey, which they made him drink. When I reached for one of the two glasses left on the table, Tom stopped my arm. Drop that glass and take the other one, he whispered. He gave the remaining glass of whiskey to Henry just as the clock began to strike midnight. Henry emptied the glass. His face grew whiter and whiter. Boys, he said, I am feeling sick. I want to lie down. Henry was asleep almost before the words were out of his mouth. In a moment, his two friends had picked him up and carried him into the bedroom. They closed the door and came back. They seemed to be getting ready to leave, so I said, Please don't go, gentlemen. She will not know me. I am a stranger to her. They looked at each other. His wife has been dead for 19 years, Tom said. Dead, I whispered. Dead or worse, he said. She went to see her parents about six months after she got married. On her way back, on a Saturday evening in June, when she was almost here, the Indians captured her. No one ever saw her again. Henry lost his mind. He thinks she is still alive. When June comes, he thinks she has gone on her trip to see her parents. Then he begins to wait for her to come back. He gets out that old letter, and we come around to visit so he can read it to us. On the Saturday night, she is supposed to come home. We come here to be with him. We put a sleeping drug in his drink so he will sleep through the night. Then he is all right for another year. Joe picked up his hat and his guitar. We have done this every June for 19 years, he said. The first year there were 27 of us. Now just the two of us are left. He opened the door of the pretty little house, and the two old men disappeared into the darkness of the Stanislaw. You have just heard the story, The Californian's Tale. It was written by Mark Twain and adapted by Donna DeSanctis. Your storyteller was Shep O'Neill. This is Shirley Griffith. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.